Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another week of Oxford Online. We're so glad that you're able to join us again today. I hope that throughout this service, you are blessed just by the ministry we're able to perform here as we sing together and as we open God's Word together. Today, we're going to be finishing up John chapter 10 and asking an important question. What will you do with Jesus, the Son of God, the promised Messiah? I hope that as we go through this text together and as we sing these songs together, you can answer that question for yourself. I'll see you at the end for some announcements. Enjoy the service.
Our scripture reading today is take found in John chapter 10, verses 19 through 42. As John chapter 10, starting at verse 19. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He's demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The words I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you are a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father has set apart at his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said, I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, Believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's good to be with you all today as we continue in our series, Essentials from the Gospel of John. And in these times, more than ever, we need the teaching of Jesus and the understanding of Jesus so that uh, we can be people that are truly walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. With so much turmoil in the world, so many things going on, Uh, We really need to be centered in the Lord Jesus. So let me pray as we begin um, this message today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us, for your grace to us, and for your word. As we've worshipped in song, as we've worshipped through hearing the word of God, and now as we pray again, I just pray for the needs of people everywhere needs within our own congregation, needs in our community, and needs in this world. And we just pray, Father, that you would bring peace and strength only as you can. And as we look at your word today, a challenging passage, I just pray that you would guide us, teach us by your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, But I've had a number of people say to me, have you washed your hands? Uh, And uh, that that whole phrase, uh, wash your hands, I I thought, where does that come from? I mean, my daughter tells me that, my wife tells me that, there's other people telling me that, politicians telling me that, healthcare unit people saying to us to wash your hands. So I looked up the phrase, and in May 1850, a prickly Hungarian Jewish obstetrician named Ignis Semmelweis stepped up to the podium at the Vienna Medical Society's lecture hall. It was an incredible night. It was a grand and 
ornately decorated room where some of the of medicine's greatest discoveries were first announced. And the evening of May 15th in 1850 would hardly be different. As he stood there, he gave his findings on something that was very important. But it got down to one thing, and it could be summed up, his thesis could be summed up in just three little words, wash your hands. Now in the mid-19th century, about five women in a thousand died in deliveries performed by midwives or at home. Yet when doctors working in the best maternity hospitals in Europe and America performed deliveries, the maternal death rate was often 10 to 20% greater. The cause was invariably childbed fever, as they called it, and a miserable end it was because within 24 hours of giving birth, the mother would die of infection. You see, what Dr. Ignis Semmelweis discovered was this, was that doctors for years would not believe or even believe him that washing your hands prevented transfer of infection. Just wash your hands. He came up with a number of things that needed to be done in order to prevent infections spread amongst people and especially from doctors who were helping mothers give birth because they were spreading infection to them. He said that before and after caring for any sick person, wash your hands. Before, during, and after preparing food, wash your hands. Before eating, wash your hands. After using the toilet, or as we like to say, the washroom here in Canada, not restroom as they say in the United States. Wash your hands after helping someone who just used the toilet those who were caregivers and others. After blowing your nose or coughing or sneezing, wash your hands. After touching an animal, animal feed or animal waste, wash your hands. After touching garbage, wash your hands. Now for years, do these doctors almost laughed him out of the lecture room that night. He was so incensed by their disregard for scientific proof on this that he moved back to Hungary where he continued as a doctor and then he died himself of a kind of an infection after a, an operation he was doing on a woman to help her live but months later he died of an infection. And now we need to understand that words without actions mean nothing. Truth with a action leads to unbelief and disaster. I mean, even in this COVID-19 era that we're in, I mean, there's been some crazy things said in order to prevent COVID-19. Even some people saying, well, if you shower every 10 minutes, you won't get the disease. And other crazy stuff and lies that are being perpetrated out there. But basic truth is often forgotten in times of crisis and in the time of Ignis Semmelweis, there, there was this disaster of all of these mothers dying soon after giving birth to their children because the simple truth was, wash your hands. Wash your hands. I mean, as we look at the book of John and as we've been looking at these messages about Jesus, we've seen the essential teachings of Jesus here. I mean, COVID-19 is the crisis in this world right, right now, but there is a greater crisis because people are going to leave this world and go into eternity without Jesus Christ. That, to me, is the greatest crisis. And I believe that Jesus Christ, by His Spirit and His Word, is reaching out today. Yes, still wash your hands, still social distance, 
Yes, wear a mask, do the practical things in this life, eat healthy, get good sleep, all of those things. But if you don't believe in Jesus, you're lost and lost forever. See, the person and work of Jesus is on display for us in the Gospel of John. Some people see Jesus as just a man, just an ordinary man. Others see him as God, but not a man. The Jewish leaders were very confused as well. And today, as we look at this passage of Scripture that Barry read for us from uh, John 10, verses 19 to the end of the chapter, you might say, wow, there's just so much here. But I want to break it down very practically for us today so as we move through this. But I want you to, to really understand the main thought today. But it's really a question. And the question is this, what will you do with Jesus, who is the Son of God, the promised Messiah? Now we see clearly what was read in verses 19 to 21 of, of John 10. Uh, I hope you have your Bibles. Turn there with me, uh, whether you have a Bible like mine or it's, you have a Bible on your tablet or your phone. Just turn to John 10. Uh, because we see, first of all, the confusion about Jesus in verses 19 to 21. There's a division. Verse 19, Jesus has healed the man born blind who now sees and his statements concerning his power to give or withhold his life cause a division amongst the Jews again, right? I mean, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon-possessed, he's raving mad. Why listen to him? And, and, and that's always the way that some people answer deep questions or they're confronted with truth that they just don't want to believe. And so they press it down, they don't want to believe, so they say whoever's giving the truth is demon-possessed or mad themselves. Much like that doctor back in Vienna back in the 1850s. They thought he was mad. But others said, there are not the say, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So others were kind of moving down the path. You know, some of them said he has a demon. Others were, were kind of moving that Jesus is divine in verse 21. How could demon heal a man? Only the Son of God could do such a miracle. Satan has power, but he doesn't use his power to help or do good. He uses his help to destroy and as Jesus gave that message a, a little bit earlier, you know, talking about I am the gate and I am the good shepherd and, you know, the wolf comes to attack and scatter the sheep and, and I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Jesus is using his power and his strength to show that he is God and he does these incredible miracles. Now, as we get into verse 22, there's the festival of dedication that Jesus is uh, coming into here. It was Hanukkah, um, and uh, this festival was all about, the, about dedication or commitment to God. And it's so, as Jesus continues to teach here, we, we have to understand this background that Jesus comes to provide complete spiritual renewal for the people of God. And he comes to bring true spirituality, the thing that they desired most, uh, not in the law, not in law keeping, but in a relationship with the God who created them and the God who wants to redeem them. So this is, with that background, we understand some new things. Not only the confusion about Jesus, verses 19 to 21, and as I said last week, we don't have to be confused about Jesus. Jesus clearly says who he is. He is the Son of God. He is the, the Messiah. He's the miracle worker, and he is the one who's going to go to the cross and die for all of our sins, be buried and raised again so that we can experience resurrection life. We'll see that next week in John 11. So in verses 22 to 30, we see the, the Christ Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ or the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. I mean, they keep probing him in verses 22 to 24. The Jews kept asking Christ, are you the Son of God, the Messiah? 
Jesus had told them before, but they refused to accept his statements that he was the legitimate and real Messiah. The proof we see from their probing is in verse 25. Uh, The proof he was the Messiah was in the miracles he performed. He did these miracles with the power of God to convince the people he was the Messiah, the Son of God. But there's the problem. And if you look at verses 26, and, and let's just go back to verse 25. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Notice what what he says in verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. They could not believe because they were not in Jesus Christ. See, those who know Jesus Christ follow him and follow his voice. And the promise here, after the probing and after Jesus' proof and after the problem is realized, the promise here is that there is eternal life in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone. Not in infant baptism, not in the sacraments, not doing good things, not being better than the other person or making comparisons uh, with others. Not, you, you can't get eternal life because your parents were Christians, but being in Jesus Christ alone. So many people are caught up in false religion like the Pharisees. We have modern Pharisees today. People who want to legislate morality. And unfortunately in many churches, they're teaching morality but not a relationship with Jesus Christ. They're missing the gospel altogether. Because when you're teaching morality, and yes we should, we should understand God's standards in that. And the only way we can live the Christian life is by knowing Jesus Christ and yielding day by day, moment by moment, to the Spirit of God. Not in our own strength, but in the strength of God Himself. Because Jesus is not in the business of renovating us. He's in the business of transforming us in Jesus Christ. Now we remove ourselves by our rejection of Jesus through our indifference in sin. And this is what the Pharisees were doing. They were rejecting Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. They were, the Pharisees were saying, well, we're good enough the way we are because we are better than all these other people. And Jesus gets a little personal about it too because uh, here he says very clearly who he is again. In verse 30, I and the Father are one. Right there on the spot, Jesus says that He and the Father are one and that He is co-equal with God the Father and as we see later in in John as well, that He is co-equal with the Holy Spirit of God. And so we see the triune God here. And and the, the... In verse 31, we see the conflict with Jesus here. In verses 31 to 38, again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? You see, there's, it's, it's an interesting conflict that the Pharisees have with Jesus. Jesus is just being very clear. He is God come in the flesh. He is the Son of God. He is the perfect man and perfect God in the one being of Jesus. And that's the most important thing we need to understand here. You see, Jesus shares a verse of Scripture that's kind of hard to understand. And they're stoning him. Notice this in verse 33. He says, why are you stoning me? And they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, notice this, claim to be God. 
So Jesus claims very clearly he is God. And we have to make a decision about that. And then Jesus goes on in verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods, little g gods, with parentheses around it, or quote marks rather, because it's, it's almost a mocking here. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scriptures cannot be set aside, what about the one the Father sent apart as his very own and sent into the world? Now, Jesus is saying something very strong to these Jewish leaders. It's actually a quote out of Psalm 82.6. It's it's kind of a difficult passage because the understanding here, there's some debate about it, that that the, the little g gods in Psalm 82, they were also the corrupt judges of Israel. These were people, not unlike today, who are kind of little gods in their own eyes. Sometimes it's political leaders that are like that in the Old Testament, judges. Sometimes it, it's, it's just people in the entertainment world, the sports world today, who, because of their success, start believing that they're little gods. The Pharisees were like this as well. That's how they kind of went around and strutted around town. And as a result of that, Jesus is saying, no, uh, like those little gods back in Psalm 82, 6, it says there in Psalm 82, 6, uh, or verse 7, that Jesus was reminding them that those who thought they were these little gods would die like mere men, if you look at verse 7. In a sense, they were legends in their own minds, you might say. And Jesus is saying, um, you can't be a legend in your own mind to follow me. And just like politicians, some politicians today, not all politicians, I want to be be clear, they promise a lot, but were corrupt, and they delivered little. And that's what Jesus is saying to them. Our life must be centered in Jesus Christ to live in the society that, that we are in today. And just like back in Jesus' time, these Pharisees who thought they were little gods, they weren't little gods at all. They were just mere men. They were looking at God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus challenges them again in verse 37. Don't believe me unless I do the miracles of God or or my Father. And he does them. And they point to him as the Messiah the Son of God. Now also, if you, uh, we're, we're reminded too in verse 38, it says, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Seeing the miracles and believing that Jesus is the Son of God, were necessary to believe in the salvation that God wants to bring. I mean, we're we're reminded here too, there's a couple of other passages that we're reminded of. In in John 14, verse 1, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And Jesus reminds us too that it's through Him that we gain access to the Father. Because he's God come in the flesh for us to save us. So let's just go back to the last part of the the chapter here. Um, And the main thought today is really a question, what will you do with Jesus, who is the Son of God, the promised Messiah? I mean, they're asking him this, and he's delivering very clearly on the answer. And they are ready to, to try to arrest him again, and um, they, but Jesus, they, they try to seize him rather, that's the word that's used there, but he escapes their grasp, he just goes. It's not his time yet. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed and many people, notice this, came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. 
Jesus escapes the clutches of these Pharisees, these little gods who thought best. And he goes over to the other side where John the Baptist baptized people. And uh, even today, you can go to these different kind of spots where they believe that John baptized and the place where Jesus in this particular chapter went to. It's a beautiful place in the country of Jordan, right along the Jordan River. Um, They try to arrest him. He escapes and he heads over there. Uh, attention was called to the fact that all of John's predictions, John the Baptist was a prophet and he prophesied concerning Jesus. Everything he said about Jesus was true. And John did no miracle, though he had the power to do so, Luke 1, 17. And here it is, is a witness, he is a witness to what Jesus Christ not only will do, But John also confirmed who Jesus was. As a result of John's witness, people accepted, it shows us in verse 42, many accepted. We don't know the exact number of the people who became followers of Jesus at that time, but because of the witness of John. So let me ask you, Christian brother or sister, what is your witness like towards others who are asking questions about Jesus. Is your life, your words, your attitudes, your work ethic all point to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? How is your witness like to those around you? See, and to those of you who are maybe watching, exploring faith for the first time, and, and, or maybe you're coming back, you used to go to church years ago You were counting on infant baptism or something else to to get you into heaven. Today I want to tell you very, ask you the question very clearly again. What will you do with Jesus who is the Son of God, the promised Messiah? Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? He is the Son of God, the promised Messiah. There is no one else like him. Yes, COVID-19 is a great crisis, but the greatest crisis is for you to reject Jesus Christ and go into a Christless eternity. Trust Him today. Repent of your sin and turn to Him by faith and allow Jesus to transform your life. Another self-help book is not going to help you. Self-help doesn't work. And there's thousands and thousands of titles about self-help out there. And yeah, we we need to improve and we we need to grow and there's all those kinds of things. But Jesus Christ isn't into self-help. And don't believe the the preachers or the modern-day prophets that say that you you can find yourself by going inside yourself. Well, when you go inside, you find out that you need Jesus Christ because you're lost without Him. And so you need to trust in the Savior just like these people had heard John's testimony about Jesus. As Jesus goes across the Jordan and they start interacting with him, they realize that he is God the Son, the Messiah, and they trust in him. So you can still wash your hands today. In fact, I hope you will. I mean, personal hygiene is very important during this time. To social distance, wash your hands after all those different times, and wear a mask when required. But please, please believe in Jesus. Follow and obey Him. Because Jesus is the Son of God, the promised Messiah. That's the answer to this question. What will you do with Jesus, who is the Son of God, the promised Messiah? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this new day that you've given to us. And for many, it could be the day of salvation where we answer the question of the morning. What will you do with Jesus, who is the Son of God, the promised Messiah? 
Lord, I pray that people would just bow their knee, maybe get to a place where they just bow before you and just trust you today. Asking you to forgive all of their sin, repenting from their own way of life, their self-improvement, their religious background, whatever it is that's been holding them back from trusting you and that they will repent and turn to you by faith today and then get up and live for you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would draw people to yourself and that your Holy Spirit would convict people of sin, righteousness, and judgment so that they can experience the new life, the resurrection life, the eternal life that we can have in Jesus and the friend who will walk with us and be with us forever. Lord, thank you for coming for us and giving us all the proof that you are the Son of God. And may your Holy Spirit indwell us and inspire us today. And may we be a people that glorify the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Be with everyone, I pray. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
as we close today, I want to ask you, what will you do with Jesus, the Son of God, the promised Messiah? See, this is an important question that everyone has to answer in their life at one point or another. If you need more information or or you need to understand more about who Jesus is before you can answer that question yourself, please reach out to us. We would love to have a conversation with you. And, And today, maybe you have, for the first time, realized that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the promised Messiah, and that what he's done on the cross is enough to pay for your sins, to make you right with God, to save you forevermore so that you can become a child of God. It's an incredible thing. And if you've realized that today, again, I would love for you to reach out to to the church. We would love to meet with you, to have a conversation with you. You see, we say here that a relationship with Jesus Christ changes everything. That relationship, though, is not just, yeah, I know the guy. No, that relationship is an intimate relationship, a relationship where you get to know Jesus more every single day. And we would love to help you experience that and grow that relationship. I also would just like to remind everyone that we will be opening up the services and having in-person services on September the 20th. September 13th, we are going to be doing a soft launch. The goal here is just to make sure that our cleaning practices, our sign-in practices, um, the video to, so that we can have online streaming as well are all working before we go um, and do a full launch on September 20th. There's going to be some limited registration for that. You can keep t- stay tuned to find out how you can sign up to join us for the soft launch on September 13th. Today is also the last day um, and the last week for virtual VBS, so make sure you check out those videos. We would just love for you to enjoy this last week as uh, we prepare for the fall and for those th- th- our, our kids to go back to school. Let's close in prayer today, and then uh, I, I encourage you just to enjoy the rest of your day. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, that you sent your Son, Jesus, that he has done so many awesome and great things. I pray today that we would know who Jesus is. It's such an important thing for us to understand. I pray that all of us who know who Jesus is, that we would continue to grow our relationship with Jesus Christ day by day as we spend time in his word and in prayer and meditating on on it and just living lives like Jesus Christ. God, will you be with our church this week? Will you give us protection? We ask for your grace and for your blessing. In your name, amen. God bless everyone. Have a great week.